So the bit I'd like to talk to you today about was a bit about the, the waves specific data that you can access at the coast. So this will include a bit of a summary on sort of the physics of the waves and why we use the numerical models to present them. Um, some impact sort of impact case studies and why the, the different kinds of waves might produce a different kind of risk at the coast. And then we'll have a quick break and then go down to the different, uh, the kinds of data that are available, what sort of outputs you might want to, to access and where you can get your hands on the data. So if you want to skip through Amani, to the summary. So the wave impacts, um, we'll talk about different kinds of, of storm waves and swell waves, how these different waves interact with changing sea level. And then the examples will be for, yeah, hopefully a few different examples at a few different islands, which will be, well, I hope, I hope something will ring true for you wherever, wherever you're sitting. So if you go to the next slide, I'll, get, I'll give a few examples of the different kinds of wave impacts that we might come across. So the most obvious and common one is coastal flooding. And then also how the waves can impact on sediment transport and erosion in the near shore. One that we've come across at previous meetings has been the impact um, on sargassum and surface transports and how the extra yes. sort of wave current induced, induced current will move this sargassum around, which can be a real problem for beaching. Then there's the, the energy of the wave. So particularly these very large swells have a lot of energy associated with them. And how might these large waves be damaging to infrastructure and sort of the, that big, that large scale erosion and that you have to defend against. So there's things like rock armoring and harbors, sea defenses. Um, we know that there are various places have lost uh, keys and things due to, due to coastal erosion. Um, then there's the offshore effect of the waves. So the impact actually, if you're sat at sea, in a, in a cruise ship, in a fishing boat, being able to know what the wave conditions and forecast are, uh, you know, if you're too rough, what you can and can't do. And there are under there sort of operational thresholds of the kind of waves and sea state that affect different operations. And then there's the environmental impacts and, and interactions between the waves and the vegetation. So the next one, I've got a quick video while I run. I'd like to launch a poll just to find out who's, who's listening and who's interested in what. So if you can tell me if you've got uh, the people on this call, are, are the waves actually important to you? And do you use any of the wave data at present? Um, this, is a, this is a flooding example from, I say, the most tangible impact of, of waves is this, the water running up the beach and over whatever sat there, be that your house or uh, in this case, a bar, I think it is. So I'll just give you a, a couple of minutes to, to write on the poll while you think about that one. And also I'd like to think from that sort of short list of, yeah, of, of kind of wave impacts, if you've got, come across things on a daily basis, what would be important to you as an impact? Of, have I missed anything out on that list? So I've got a second, if I just close, shall I close? How, you normally do a two, sort of two minute poll, don't you? And then, um, then I can ask you the, the specific question about what kinds of things are familiar to you? So I was, um, the, the local, the, the wave modeling in the Caribbean is kind of new to me because the previous work I've done is in the UK and we get very different wave, like kinds of waves and kinds of weather which comes with it. So it's interesting to me to see the different risks from what essentially is the same thing um, and how, yeah, how you can live with waves in the, a very different kind of climate. So if I end that poll now, does it just automatically publish it? If I end the poll? If you end it, then it'll ask you to share results. So we just click share results. There. there we go. So look, I like this. Everyone says that they're important and some people use data. So I'd like I'd like to get that no, I don't use data yet to, to increase a little bit more. <laughs> and then if I do the second question on that, which is about what we what do you use this data for? So, so I can give some examples of say what we've done for this, um, the UK wave data. So we recently, um, we published a data set about two, three years ago, where we published uh, wave data and also sort of future projections of how this might change around the UK. And I was actually really surprised about the range of applications where this data has been used. So we had um, someone looking at volcanic uh, erosion of volcanic sediments and transport in the Azores. We had marine habitat vulnerability assessments in Wales, um, some more beach erosion and, and future of French beaches in uh, the Atlantic facing French coast climate projections. Um, we had someone looking at the, the lighthouse vulnerability assessment, so a bunch of engineers. 
environmental suitability where seagrasses can can establish or not and one about reef worms and about how these habitat builders can uh, be really sensitive to the kind of waves and the kind of wave climate that there are so I thought that was quite a quite a range of things so I'd be interested if you could um if you've got a sort of an other that you've that you've identified it would be really nice to see that in the chat if you've got something say oh no well you've missed off this is very important or or actually it isn't such a big influence because I think quite a lot of the focus we've looked at so far has been on extreme events and how hurricane waves or storm surges which can be confused how they impact at the coast and there's actually a lot more going on that that is influenced by the waves okay so I can do that one and share the results so environmental impacts flood erosion not a problem for shipping maybe not on this call so that's really interesting thank you so let's move on to the just a little bit about the, the physics so probably this is what people know about already um, but just to, to get our get the eye in that we are talking about surface waves which are wind generated coming from tiny little gentle ripples up to the big long swells that we saw in the previous video when we model these we represent the whole spectrum so I think Judith did some introduction introduction of this on Tuesday and these spectral models are representing the, the amount of energy in the total system so not just just trying to say one way we just say what's there across this whole range so on the next slide um, I'll just talk about the wave growth so all, all waves will start from this you know imagine this sort of still mill pond surface and then as the wave as the winds blow over these ripples grow and the, and the energy moves up this sort of length scale to the longer more energetic waves so this short wind sea that you see right underneath the storms can be quite uh, low but choppy and then these long sea swells that are generated far off can be smooth but they've got actually they've got a lot of energy in them because they've, they've built up up this spectral energy peak. Um, the next slide shows how these 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 waves add on to the other components if you like of of the sea level so we talked uh, we talk a lot about the the storm surge that's generated by by a hurricane or a cyclone but there's also the component of that which is the storm surge which is the the, the pressure driven bit of how the water surface is moving up and down but then on top of that you have these fast moving swell waves and, and other other waves so being able to know what part of that flood is coming i mean it doesn't matter if you if it's flooding you're underwater but it's being able to know if this is caused by a storm surge or if this is caused by a wave we have a better idea how to predict it and how to study it um, and that can hopefully be more useful for the sort of coastal risk assessment as well and it can be i don't difficult to, to to pick these apart because the swell can come at the same time as the storm surge so it's hard to distinguish where that water's coming from but if you can get them get them right then you can get a better prediction of actually how much water will be coming in over the coast so i've got a couple of photos if you slip skip through to the next one so the couple of examples this is from from st lucia and the dcsa the most tangible aspect is this coastal flooding and then i've got a slide on coastal erosion so this is um in st vincent where there seems to be um more interactions sort of with the, between different natural hazards so they get a lot of these deep trough systems as i understand it so really intense rainfall events which can lead to the offshore flash flooding through these these canyons and the loose sediments but that can combine with waves coming in at the coast so you've got this sort of yeah double-edged sword of, uh, of the two different hazards coming together so we need to be able to study the waves in that context and then there's sort of it's an infrastructure risk so similarly the these large long waves have the power which can start to undercut uh, infrastructure and this is particularly important when you've got uh, as Judith said very steep topography with the infrastructure is all focused right along the coast so if you've got your single highway or if you've got your you know most of the buildings are close to close to the shoreline it just doubles up that um, vulnerability um, and the next one is uh, about sediment transport so this is partly in the interaction with the vegetation as well so if you've got a lot of sort of tourist real estate where you might be cutting down the vegetation to because you want a nice open sandy beach what you end up with is an unstable sediment which can be then mobilized really quickly by the waves and you get to this sort of overwashing situation where you get a lot of that of that sediment transport moving around the last one is about um shipping so while i think when we had a, a visit to st vincent and we had a meeting over there they actually that month they hadn't had their cruise ship come in which is a huge part of the, the tourism income 
So they have the, the, the cruise ships that move around different Caribbean islands, stop over for a few nights and then move on. But they had very stormy weather. They couldn't approach. So one storm and then you've, you've lost all of that business, all that trade. So being able to know what the, the wave conditions are and make sure that your harbours are suitable to, to get in and are sheltered enough, that can make a big impact on the revenue. So there's those more indirect, if you like, wave impacts, but maybe shipping wasn't so interesting here. So yeah, just, this is just another video of the, the kind of swell. So it's, yeah, it's very different to, the, if, we, if we sit in, a, in Liverpool Bay, we've got very short, little waves that come very fast and these and they get these sort of long swells that have traveled all the way across the Atlantic get very very different but even if you've got the same sort of wave height these way these swells have very high energy and they can be more damaging so even if the storm isn't sat right on top of you these swell waves can be more damaging than uh, a little local storm so the, the next slide I just want to flick on to how we uh, use the numerical models to simulate these waves um, so we use these, yeah, we use these spectral wave models where we blow wind over the surface and then watch how the wave spectra grow, move around and then dissipate. So it's just about energy in and energy out and how it moves around. Um, with all the dissipation being the, when it feels the, the fresh water, it feels, feels the friction at the bottom and starts breaking close to the coast. Um, so I've got a movie which shows the kind of outputs that we get. So this is an example from a global wave model that we ran. So all the, all the hot colors, all the reds are the high wave heights and the calmer conditions are in the, in the blues. So what you can see is if you, you know, look at the North Atlantic, you can see these storms that start off on the Eastern seaboard of America and move across the North Atlantic. That's following in the track of the storm. And you can see these little event, individual events start, grow, and then move across the ocean. And there's sort of bluer areas where you can see that the islands are sheltering or small, smaller land masses are sheltering us from high wave energy, but you need to um, have this kind of global picture to be able to understand what's happening with the waves at the local scale. You can't just uh, just model your little box because it's these sort of these distant storms that actually can come in and cause the coastal impacts. So the next slide is about what kind of things that we can represent. So the typical variables that we get out of our wave models are the significant wave height, which is a integrated measure of how big the waves are. So it's just based on the energy, but it's, um, it's, sort of, it's sort of a standard idea of how big your typical waves are, if you like. And the direction from which they're coming from and the wave period, they're, they're sort of the normally the three ones that most people are interested in and the most useful. Um, we often use the peak period. So rather than the sort of the average of all the waves, we find the period that's associated with those larger wave heights. So that gives you an impression of where the, where the most damaging ones, where the most energetic waves are coming from. And another thing that you can do is also break down from this model is break down which ones are being generated locally under the storm and which are the ones of the, these remote ones that have come from a storm far offshore. So the kind of outputs you get um, are you can, you can get some nice model maps and, and give you a whole sort of synoptic view, or you can pull out time series of where you're, where you're sat. So, Judith just um, showed the map of the boys earlier, but this was just a, an example for Hurricane Thomas, I think it was, which is um, November 20, yeah, November 20, 2010. So in this case, uh, you can see the sort of typical, on the left-hand side, there's the map, is the typical wave climate of, of the Caribbean Sea, where you've got this blue area, which is sheltered around the Windward Islands, and then larger waves off in, off in the Atlantic. And then the right hand panel shows this time series of the observed significant wave height at the buoy uh, in, in blue and the red one is the model. And you can see that the model is able to capture sort of the, the background state quite well. And then this, this huge peak, peak wave event of sort of four plus meters that happened at the peak of the storm. The, the model's not doing a perfect job, you know, the timing's a little bit earlier and maybe the model is not getting that peak quite right. So definitely the model's not perfect, but we're able to say, say we can get we can get a storm we can get it in the right place and then we can understand the limitations of the model but we have to absolutely have to interrogate these models in the context of real observations so you might have a, a number everywhere and data everywhere from the model but you need to say well is that you know how good is this what's the uncertainty given on how, how good we know the model is able to perform so yeah you can get these these kind of outputs another one is the, a wave rose or polar diagram so this is sort of more to summarize the the average climate, so this sort of the, the mean condition. 
and that's often used to just look at the the period and the directions so you can say well you know we're a, we're a windward island most of our swells are coming from the east and, and they're of this kind of size these are more useful for sort of planning documents if you're saying you know what is the typical conditions what are we building to defend against um, and these are obviously these are much more lightweight than so the kind of thing that Judith was describing with these big heavy net CDF gigabytes of files. These are things that you can yeah, attach to an email and use in an Excel spreadsheet. So the other example of this sort of kind of lookup table, sorry, if you just go back on the, the second half of that slide, Amani, the lookup table uh, is colored by frequency. So this is a plot of the wave height along the top in the period. Um, and the, the color is how common they are. So like the, the reds and reds and yellows, they happen most often. So 10% of the time you'll get these sort of very low long period waves. And then more rarely, so like 1% of the time, these green numbers tells you something about the extreme so that you can get wave heights of up to sort of three meters and very long period, but they don't happen very often. So those are the kind of lightweight statistics that you might pull out from these models for your, for your own interest, site of interest. Uh, when you don't need the full heavy data set. Okay, um, yeah, move on. So what I was saying about these difference between these short wind sea waves and the swell waves are about how, how damaging they can be. So yeah, we're looking at like, if you're sat underneath a storm as it passes, you get these short, high, locally generated wind, wind waves and they can cause a lot of damage, so coastal erosion, damage to coastal structures. Um, and it's easy to sort of, <laughs> like to predict in a way. So if you're looking at the weather forecast, you can go, well, look, we know we've got a big storm. We know we're going to get this kind of kind of ocean risk happening at the same time. But you also get the other the other side of things, which is the, the next slide shows a distant storm. So a fair weather storm, if you like, where even though you are not directly getting the high wind events, the heavy rains, the low pressure system, you'll still experience large swell waves that are coming from far away. So these can expect more of a flood hazard, more of an unexpected hazard. So yeah, flood hazard, erosion, infrastructure, even on a sort of a nice day, if you like. So being able to understand these different sources of, of wave and the different kind of risk associated with them can be useful. I'll just show you one specific, specific example of that, which is for, I don't know what year it is, okay, 2014, Hurricane Gonzalo. So this is showing um, the passage of a storm over time. So it's a time series of a week or so where you can see the top panel is the sea level pressure. The next one is the wind speed. And then the bottom two panels are the wave height broken down across these two kinds of waves. So the wind sea in blue and then the swell in green. Um, I don't know, oh, I've got the storm track on the next page, but what you can see is the low pressure. So that this, this trough in low pressure around the um, 10th of December, sorry, 12, it's 10, 12, it's the 12th of October. <laughs> 10, 12 anyway. So you get that low pressure and then that big peak in wind speed associated with it. So that is the passage of the storm at this point. And what you see is as that storm passes, you can see like a double peak in the, in the blue wave heights. And that's showing as the eye of the storm is coming over, you get the little dip, but it's, it's big peaks in the local waves associated with the passage of that storm. And it's quite a clear signature. Whereas if you look at the swell waves, <coughs> excuse me, this the last panel, the green panel, you get it's not such a clear signal but you do get a large wave associated with it so of the same order sort of two, two meters ish and it also stays high for quite a long time so even though the storm's come and gone the wind's died down the pressure's pressure's gone back to normal you've still got these large swell waves sort of coming in behind it um, if you look at the next slide this you can see it in a map as well so this is showing you a, a snapshot for uh, every day i think every half a day every 12 hours as, as this storm passes by the red line is just the track, so you can see where that eye of the, of the storm is following along as we go from the, the top left down to the bottom right. Um, so the yellow colours are showing high wind sea waves, so you can see those waves are sitting right on that, on the track of the storm where that low pressure sen the centre is, and it follows it along quite closely and then around, you know, around away from it there's no locally generated, there's none of these wind sea waves. The second slide shows a map of the, the swell waves, which looks rather different. So in this case, it's much smoother because those wind sea, the, the swell waves have sort of spread out and gone away from the eye of the storm. But they also you know, take up a lot, a lot more space. So even areas that aren't touched by that storm track at all, 
um, if you just look away from that red line, are still getting quite high swell waves that are coming at a different time as well. So being able to understand these different kinds of waves and the risk associated with them is, yeah, is, is the way we're trying to use these models to, to pick apart what the water, where the water's coming from and how it can cause a different kind of risk to, to different places. So I think, yeah, we're going to have a, have a break in a minute, but I just want to say the next, the next bit will go from how to use this sort of global model output and down to a, a beach or sort of harbour scale, regional model scale. So we'll look at how, um, yeah, some of those, those kinds of output can be used and then talk about how to access the data and go through it. So I'll, I'll probably, probably try and have another poll as well in the second bit, but if we do, if we do our 10 minute break now and then I'll come back and do the island scale stuff after that. Is that okay? <laughs> 